Hey everyone. Hello, hello. So uh, it looks like we are live. Um, thank you so much for tuning in today. I can uh, I can see you all joining me. Hi, Mike. Hi, David. <laughs> it's so nice to see you all um, joining for our Instagram live. Uh, and uh, I'm so glad you're all here. I, I wish I could see all of your faces too. <laughs> so uh, I'll go ahead and introduce myself. Um, I'm Rebecca Armstrong. I'm an educator here at Cooper Hewitt. Um, and I'll be joined shortly by OJB uh, Landscape Architecture, the 2020 National Design Award winner for a landscape architecture um, for a special garden visit and conversation with them. So, you know, I, uh, I can't tell you how excited I am to um, speak with them and to celebrate their work um, and their achievement this year. Um, so, yeah, so stay tuned. Um, we're just so excited for them to hop on. And uh, you'll also get to see um, a, a little bit of a sneak peek and tour of their incredibly beautiful project, Sunnyland Center and Garden, uh, all the way from sunny, uh, sunny California. So uh, a quick note as well, that uh, this is actually the very last program of National Design Month at Cooper Hewitt. So we're closing out the month of October with you. Um, so thank you so much for being here. Uh, and you know, all month long, we've been offering virtual programs to all, all kinds of audiences all over, um, featuring our incredible National Design Award winners um, across all categories. And uh, you know, thank you uh, very much to everybody who has joined us throughout the month. Um, we're so happy that you're able to, um, to be with us um, um, and, and so much gratitude as well to Target um, for making the month of programming possible for us. Um, so we'll be joined very shortly by OJB uh, landscape architect uh, Jim Burnett and partner Dylan Deers, as well as the director of Sunnylands, Janice Lyle. Um, so let's give them just a moment or two to log in here. All right. All right. He is. Hey, Janice. It's nice to see you. <laughs> good morning. Good, good afternoon. It's morning over on the West Coast where you're joining from. Um, so uh, thank you so much for being here. Um, if you just tuned in uh, to the audience, welcome. My name is Rebecca. Um, I'm an educator here at Cooper Hewitt, and I'm here with OJB Landscape Architecture, winner of the 2020 National Design Award in uh, Landscape Architecture, of course. Um, so before we speak with Jim and Dylan of OJB, I'd love to introduce uh, first our lovely guest, uh, Janice Lyle, uh, director of Sunnyland's Center and Garden, um, designed by OJB. So that's where uh, everyone is joining us from. Um, and we you know, can't wait to visit the gardens in person someday, someday soon. Um, but Janice, uh, perhaps you can kick us off by telling us a little bit about the mission of Sunnylands. Sure. Well, we're seated, seating, we're seated uh, at the public access part of Sunnylands. And Sunnylands is the name given by Walter and Leonore Annenberg to their winter home that they built in the 1960s here in the California desert. Their home is acknowledged now as a mid-century modern architectural landmark, and it sits on 200 acres of parkland in the middle of the desert. During the Annenberg's lifetime, they um, hosted seven U.S. presidents. They welcomed British royalty like the Queen of England, and they um, engaged with uh, Hollywood celebrities like Bob Hope and Frank Sinatra. And that created a, a slice of American life and provides us with an opportunity to talk about the history of America in the 20th century. Um, it, at the end of their lifetimes, the Annenbergs set up a trust for the purpose of preserving Sunnylands as a high level retreat center that, it, that hopes to foster international agreement and as a place where people can come and visit and learn about the significance of this very special place. So 
in 2006, the, this project, this public part of our project began and it sits adjacent to the historic estate. It um, has a visitor center that was designed by architects uh, Fred Fisher and Partners. And that building references the mid-century modern house um, on the historic estate. That the visitor center is placed in a nine acre garden. And the garden um, designed by OJB was was inspired by the Annenberg's Impressionist and Post-Impressionist paintings collection. It is incredibly beautiful. More than 700,000 people have visited since we opened in 2012. And they have been um, exposed to and the delightful recipients of a space that is serene and encourages solitude and contemplation, but at the same time, they've been engaged in public programs, thousands of them, that allow them to, to be in a community together um, within this beautiful space. So I think the best person to talk about this incredible garden is Jim Burnett. So I welcome Jim here on my left. Thank you. Thank you. Hello. Hello. Hi, Rebecca. How are you? I'm Thank great. you, Janice. You? Appreciate that that introduction. And uh, it's amazing morning here at Sunnylands. Um, it's about 60 degrees and the weather is just perfect. Uh, I'm here with Dylan Deers, my partner. Uh, and Dylan's first day at OJB was uh, his first assignment. First day on the job was to work at Sunnylands. And he had a big role in the execution of this garden and kind of seeing it through during the whole process. Um, and in celebration of uh, National Design Month, we want to thank Cooper Hewitt for uh, being a National Design Award winner. It's a, a tremendous honor and uh, we're happy to be here today. And uh, to kind of reflect on what design means to us as landscape architects, uh, I want to just add that it's, it, as in this assignment that we took on over 10 years ago, uh, it's more than just problem solving. That's just one of the important issues of kind of trying to create this setting for retreat. Uh, this this project was really about uh, kind of getting people away from uh, the everyday life and putting them in a setting that would be conducive to sharing ideas. And um, I think design is uh, is is the sciences. It's it's kind of layering in the agronomy the botanical aspects, the uh, soils issues, the uh, geology, the, um, all the climate issues, but it also is uh, kind of layering in uh, the, uh, the kind of artist touch, the, the design that makes it so beautiful to be here. Uh, landscape architecture has grown uh, tremendously in the last 20 years with uh, pressures that have been put on, um, you know, uh, with climate change and all the uh, the kind of pressures of, uh, of, of, of kind of maintaining what we have and uh, taking care of it. And, and I think in, during the pandemic, it's been really important to realize that one of the only safe places that we can go and take our mask off is actually out in the landscape. Um, and lastly, I think nature, um, as we find here today and on a lot of, uh, a lot of projects that, that we've been fortunate to work on, nature is really the great healer, it helps to restore us. It uh, changes the cells in our body. It gives us uh, promise and uh, kind of the, the ability to kind of uh, change our mood. It makes us happier. Uh, getting out of doors is something that's extremely important for the psyche. And uh, as we've all found out, just taking a walk outside uh, during this, this last seven months has been really critical to um, mental and physical health. Certainly. Thank you so much, Jim. I mean, it's, it's calming just to like, look at the screen and see what's behind you. It's so sunny and so green um, and spacious. So, I mean, it's, it's just beautiful. Um, I know exactly what you mean about the tranquility of, of being outside. And, and I feel like it's so necessary right now in such stressful times. Um, you know, and, and it's so clear with projects like Sunnylands, um, as well as, uh, I, you know, I think of like Clyde Warren Park in Dallas, which 
literally reconnects different parts of the city that, you know, your work also focuses so much on this need for community. Um, and, and so I'm wondering if you can tell us a little more about the inspiration of Sunnylands and some of the key design elements that, uh, that you use there to, to sort of foster those connections between people in an outdoor space. Well, I think um, when we began the project, it was interesting that um, it was meant to be a uh, uh, kind of a, a launching place or a, a, the setting for people to come here, understand the legacy of the Annenbergs, and then move to the historic estate. Uh, but I think as we started to develop the design and we had Mrs. Annenberg's input, uh, she really felt that this could be uh, as significant or as important as the estate, and it could be a place where people would come and, and walk the grounds, that they would come and uh, uh, have uh, yoga class, they would come and uh, come to art exhibitions, that this could be a community center. And uh, so I think it's, it was really Mrs. Annenberg's inspiration that, that this be a really important community cultural asset uh, I think the design in particular, uh, we, we followed her lead in that she wanted to have a landscape that was uh, beautiful, but uh, not spare and not sparse. She wanted it to be, uh, she described it as being lush. And I think we were able to uh, look at things she loved, which were the impressionist paintings and create this large swaths of painterly uh, masses of desert botanical plants. Um, I think, um, you know, if you look at the mid-century inspiration and working with Fred Fisher, he was phenomenal. And, and his interpretation of the Quincy Jones uh, historic estate and bringing that to a kind of current, current approach to the, uh, to the pavilion here, we uh, created an entry that um, is, is a bit of a surprise. You kind of come in through through the trees and then you, you open up, you see the center and then you see the San Jacinto Mountains behind. Uh, but, you know, I think uh, what a lot of people really enjoy is this idea that um, you can leave the outer world behind, just like Walter and Lenore Annenberg envisioned the historic estate that when world leaders and their friends would come here and talk about critical issues facing the country, facing the world uh, with education and, and, uh, and, and kind of international challenges, uh, everything could be left at the gate. And when you come here, you really do uh, take a deep breath. Um, when you walk the grounds, your heart rate goes down. Uh, this, the, the crush of gravel under your foot gives you, a, a registers completely different with you and uh, helps to kind of slow the pace and uh, really does a great job of, uh, of kind of uh, recharging you at the same time. Yeah, that word lush is also the first one that came to my mind. So I, I, I was anticipating you using that. And then I was like, oh, right, that's, that makes so much sense because it's also how I would describe so many like you know, beautiful um, impressionist paintings of the outdoors, of, of gardens and, you know, uh, looking at light and water and the air quality and all these things together to make just like an encompassing space for people to be in. That's really beautiful. So um, I can't wait to see a little more of the garden um, in just a bit. But, you know, I also um, wanted to maybe ask Dylan to tell us um, more specifically about um, the aspect of the gardens that, you know, it, it responds very directly to um, the climate crisis. In addition to being, of course, very beautiful and historic, I know there's a lot of research that's that's done there at the center. So maybe you can touch a bit on that. Yeah, well, you know, um, the center and gardens here in the Coachella Valley coming off of really the, the hottest recorded uh, summer in history is, is very much parallel to, to your comment there. Uh, and what a lot of the, the global environmental um, story that, that we're all living through. Um, five months, extreme heat, uh, the, the desert really um, pronounces that more than any other climate in the world. Um, and, you know, part of, of what this garden really has done is embarked um, in the story of, of a living laboratory, um, meaning in a way that, that the trust and the foundation and, and the team and the crew that 
really uh, nurtures and loves this garden uh, day after day is, is, is trying to understand um, the ecology uh, and, and really um, create a, a sense of, of place here. But when we, we moved forward with um, the design, uh, we, we brought on a renowned horticulturist, Mary Irish, um, and we really embarked in a journey of, of finding um, the plant species that would work well and adapt. Um, so the, you know, the garden here is both uh, native and adaptive arid um, desert plant material that, that really has um, thrived um, to this location. Um, but when we went through, we, we actually, the, the collection here of plant material is about a 53,000 plants. And that was no small feat. And, and we worked with uh, nursery and, and growers across um, the Southwest region really to make this, this all happen um, at, at once. Um, so, you know, that's a little bit of a backstory um, to the, the purpose and, and ecology uh, and, and how the gardens came to fruition. Very cool. I'd love to know a little about um, the plants that I see behind you too. There's like a, a mirrored pond. Um, can you just maybe zoom in a bit on, on what's behind you there? Yeah, so um, here, uh, really flanking right next to uh, the, the terrace here, uh, we're on the west side of the building. And um, this is a significant array of the golden barrel cactus um, beneath a, a um, a grove of palabreas, so you have the really serene and, and dappled light uh, provided, and you know, as Jim alluded to, the, the comfort uh, and sense of, of uh, respite within the, the desert. A lot of what was studied was, you know, the shade and the canopy and how we brought um, the visitors, you know, to the outdoor environment here. Um, the water features um, were designed in a way that you could turn the, the water actually on or off. Um, right now, for uh, for good audio, the water's calmed down and, and it's just welled. Um, but there's a cascade uh, reservoir beneath us, so normally you have a really nice, tranquil, uh, moving, serene uh, quality of, of movement to the water features here. There's two basins that that flank the um, the terrace on the, the south and the north. Very cool. Well, it's stunning and it's it's so cool to see those cacti behind you. I imagine also the water is a bit of a barrier for like little kids trying to go over and hug a cactus. You know? <laughs> yeah. Um, well, that's amazing. So I wonder if we can just take uh, uh, maybe Zach, um, our lovely camera person behind the scenes over at OJB can do like a, a 360 panoramic view of what's around you or, or maybe in a moment we can take a little uh, stroll around the gardens. Great. Yeah. Do we want to do the straw? She's still talking. You can't hear her. Oh, it's a delay. You want to do a straw? Do you have any further questions, or we can take you want to take a quick little walk and pick up the camera? Yeah, uh, we we can take a stroll now and maybe pick up uh, pick up the conversation as we're walking. Okay. okay. Great. <laughs> Wow. So this is the cactus garden. Um, and over at the historic estate, there's a cactus garden right outside of um, Mrs. Zanderberg's bedroom. And uh, we felt it was appropriate to bring in some specimen uh, cactuses that would, uh, you know, could, could be kind of the one spot in the garden where we're really showing off individual species. And uh, there's two of these panels here. And then on the other side, um, there's so both the north and the south side of, of these sister water features. We have the, the cactus. It's really cool to see the juxt juxtaposition of those very, very tall cacti on the left of the screen and then the little you know, the little um, round ones on the right in those rows. There's just, the, it's, it's amazing to see how many different varieties there are. Yeah, and we're moving toward the, 
the um, Great Lawn here, which is um, the one spot on the at the center where we actually have used some water. I mean, used water enough to sustain a lawn, and it's become kind of the community heart. So this is the place where um, you know big events happen. Uh, there's an art ex exhibition happening here today. Um, then we're about to walk um, trees that and and Rebecca, you mentioned um, the kind of variety of, of uh, species. There's um, 70 or so varieties of species on, on the 15 acre project. Really, it's a nine wow. acre garden that has uh, about two miles of, of walking trails. Um, so what you see here is, is really the main event lawn. And um, you know, the, as Jim described, the, the circle starts to lead outward to uh, trails and, and walking gardens. Um, on the, the left is the labyrinth, and um, we have, there's a small event lawn panel um, to the right where you see a few um, guests and visitors walking right now. Thank you so much for this view. The, seeing the mountains behind, too, like, well, first they're stunning, and also it gives a really cool context into sort of the environment of, um, of the area. They're very arid looking. Um, yeah, we I were, imagine we were, that lawn is a, is a hot commodity for our events and weddings and, and whatnot, too. <laughs> it, is, it is a hot commodity. It's used quite often. Um, and this part of the landscape, um, the West Terrace and West Lawn and Gardens, is um, held together by this double row of Palo Verdes. And then we keep them, or the foundation keeps them, prune to a point where you still get the, uh, the view to the mountains above. And as you, we're, unfortunately we can't walk into the gardens because we're, we're losing our, our service, but as you move into the gardens, things loosen up quite a bit. It becomes a lot more uh, informal and uh, the larger trays of, of landscape um, kind of follow you through the, through the gardens, but there's places to get lost in those spaces uh, beyond the, the the, the uh, ally of, uh, of Palo Verdes. That sounds amazing. I mean, you know, yeah, we, we certainly don't want to lose you and, uh, and drop off the conversation, but I guess that just means uh, we'll all have to, to visit in person eventually when it's safe to travel again. I, I really look forward to being able to walk through those, uh, through those trees and those trails someday soon. So cool. Um, so we talked a little bit about, um, you know, the, the yeah. sense of community and, and looking at the lawn and, and Jim, what you mentioned about that being a sort of a key gathering place of, of, of the gardens. I wanted to ask you also, you know, through uh, the COVID-19 crisis, people have more um, increasingly looked to outdoor spaces, especially um, Some of the philosophies of, of your design style um, change or, or grow as people um, uh, more and more look to being outside during this time so that they can connect. We missed a little bit of that. What, what can you re oh. repeat the question? I'm sorry, it was breaking up, Rebecca. Yeah, of course, no problem. Um, <laughs> Yeah, it's, you know, it's so nice to be virtual and have all these amazing platforms for like virtual programming <laughs> and virtual conversations, but there's always, there's always some uh, technical difficulties. So, you know, I was just asking about, um, about this current time that we're in with COVID-19 um, and that sort of prompting people to um, really look to like the outdoors as a place to gather more, somewhat more safely, um, especially with masks on. 
um, and be able to connect with each other rather than staying inside. Um, and who knows what, what the fall will bring. Hopefully for you, people can still gather out <laughs> outside uh, being in the California environment. But um, I'm curious to know how um, this moment in time has sort of maybe made you rethink um, or strengthen some of the philosophies of your, um, of your practice and your design? Great, great question. Um, I think, uh, you know, it, I think strengthening the, the principles and the beliefs in our, in our practices is, is, is a good way of putting it. Um, you know, again, I think people really feel safe in the outdoors. They, uh, parks have been set up in a lot of cities as the kind of hub for distributing water and food for uh, testing, for voter registration, for protest and, and uh, free speech. And so I think we're, it's, a, it's an important time for our public open space because it really is uh, critical in taking care of our community and providing access um, in a healthy way for our community. And there are a lot of initiatives going on right now that are have been pushing this idea, national, um, the Trust for, for Public Land has been pushing this concept of uh, every city having, or every resident in a city being within a 10 minute walk of public open space. And uh, we strongly subscribe to that idea that, um, can you hear me okay? Yeah, I was, sorry, I was just responding to you. <laughs> I agree. Yeah, I just That's didn't know if we lost you. Okay, Dylan, do you want to? Yeah, no, well, I, I think one of the things um, that we're we're talking a lot in, in the studio, uh, and and with many clients in cities across the country, is 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 really this notion of kind of reclaiming what was um, so prominent for uh, vehicles, meaning, you know, in particular, LA and so many cities across the country have. Um, you know, in order to keep restaurant and businesses alive, have moved outdoors and spilled into traffic lanes and, and roads have been closed. And there's this great notion of uh, really rethinking our systems and uh, our infrastructure. If, if you're looking at, you know, roads maybe compromising really, um, say, 30 percent of, of our um, public lands, can, can we reorient that back to, to our communities? Uh, can we maybe adjust our, our way of life as we have really the last nine months uh, to make these um, uh, infrastructure elements actually serve the community and, and be part of uh, an open space? That's so interesting because I think, you know, it's one thing to imagine landscape architecture in your field is so vital for creating public spaces and, and you know, um, natural areas for people to enjoy. Um, and it, it, you really do have to think in terms of the whole system because if people can't get to those parks and it's not sort of like incorporated into the, um, the um, ecosystem of like an urban area, especially with LA, I know the traffic is crazy, um, then you know, you, you really have to think systemically. So Dylan, that's fascinating. Um, thank you for, for, for bringing that up. Um, speaking of, of uh, you know, looking at your field, um, I, I know that with the change in climate, um, the landscape architecture field is really forced to adapt and change quickly to respond, maybe um, more so than, than other design fields um, in terms of, of um, climate change. So knowing that it's a, an increasingly interdisciplinary field that works closely with um, ecologists and, and architects, um, scientists and um, vintners and, and artists um, as well, you know, just to name a few, how do you see the, the field changing? Um, you know, I, I'd love to Are you are you all there? Well, yeah, we we caught we it broke up just a little bit, but I I, I understand the question. Um, I think landscape architects are taking taking up a, a much greater leadership role in and kind of pulling together teams of people and looking at uh, global issues 
looking at how climate change affects our cities, how uh, sea rise affects our cities, uh, leading master plan efforts for, for entire cities. Uh, and that's very exciting because, you know, I've always felt that landscape architecture was more than, than uh, you know, than trees and grass and garden design, that it, that it, that it could be, uh, that, that, that our profession could take a bigger role. And again, I think we're, we're trained in uh, planning, uh, engineering, civil engineering, um, some transportation planning, uh, architecture. Um, so I think we, we do kind of bridge a lot of different uh, categories and uh, the ecology is such an important role in, in, in kind of taking care of, of, uh, of cities and taking care of our environment. I think understanding that is an overlay. I will say that our teams are getting bigger each year too. So we're bringing in mm. one more specialists. So we don't, we don't profess to be uh, experts in, um, in all of the different disciplines that deal with the sciences. But um, it is really exciting to see landscape architects be the, the point on some really large commissions that are, that are game changing, that are changing policy in the way that we interact with uh, with our environments. Certainly. Dylan, anything to add there? Yeah, I think, you know, I was uh, speaking um, to, to one of my uh, college professors who's the department chair at Cal Poly yesterday, and and he was talking about curriculum. And, and you know, I think one of the important things to do this field is is really the way in which we look at global issues and addressing very um, complicated and complex issues. You know, Jim mentioned some of uh, what we're seeing through the environment. And, um, you know, there's in the urban fabric, we, we have a lot to, to deal with as sea level rise, you know, projects 70, 80 plus inches in certain cities. Um, we're, we're not designed for, for that right now. And, and how do we look at these, um, you know, broad scale, challenges um, and, and, you know, come together as a team and, um, you know, uniquely kind of innovate um, solutions and um, come forward with, um, you know, that critical problem solving. Um, so, you know, that that's something I think, you know, whether it's really the landscape architect and environmental design uh, is, is um, I think a lot of what you see where the profession and, and this discipline uh, headed towards. Yeah, it definitely takes everyone to sort of be on board and work as a team, right? It's like, it's a, yeah, it's vital. So, um, team player. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> um, you know, it, it, we're just about out of time. I know it's just past 1230, but um, Jim and Dylan, it has been an absolute honor to speak with you both. Um, and uh, again, many, many congratulations on, on winning the National Design Award this year to OJB. Um, it's, it's been wonderful to talk with you and to see uh, the incredible Sunnylands. Um, it's gorgeous. Um, and I hope that uh, I get to visit soon. Great. Thank you very much. We hope you do too. And uh... Thanks again to Cooper Hewitt for being such strong advocates for design. Absolutely. Maybe we can end with one last pan around the space to see those, those cacti again. Yeah. Zach? Zach, take it away. <laughs> take it away. Give it a whirl. That's so cool. Yeah, thanks for joining us uh, this, this morning or afternoon, where, whatever time zone you're in. Um, really honored to, to be with you and, and share the gardens. Well, thank you so much. And, and thanks to, um, you know, everyone in the audience for joining us today. We're, we're glad you were able to hop on. <laughs> See you next time. Okay. All right. Thank, thank you, Rebecca. You. Appreciate Bye. it. Bye-bye.